don't lump me in. I am serious. This is Aubrey from Crybaby Settlemental Homestead. I am responding to Alaska Prepper's video that was just posted called Warning USDA Report Warns American Public. And I am speaking out about this because I am a science teacher. So I know firsthand what is being taught in American classrooms. I know what is in the NGSS standards, which is a national standards for science, next generation science standards. You should check that out, NGSS, and see what is actually being asked of science teachers to teach our young people. And it is not the propaganda that people are saying it is. In fact, a lot of the things that are being said um, could be individual teachers on their own soapbox with their own ideas and their own belief system. Anyone can be on a soapbox, especially when you're giving the given the latitude in your own classroom to have kind of your own um, your own little world. Okay, but we are being held to national standards, and if you don't want something in the standards, then communities need to speak up so that those standards reflect the values and the information that we want all of our young people to have. There is quite a bit of buy-in and um, collective information that goes into selecting standards. These are national level standards. I will tell you, I am, a, I am certified in biology and I teach science. So let me talk about the points that I saw in the video um, and I want to make sure that I address them as accurately po as possible so I have some, some notes I jotted down. Okay, so one of the things is that um, this is not new, you guys. When I, you know, I, I'm going to back up to my experience as a student. I remember in fourth grade, I, horrible teacher, by the way, but she taught the curriculum that she was assigned to teach. And it was a Department of Defense school, the Dodd schools. Now it's called DODEA schools, and I was living in Germany attending Kaiser Slaughter Elementary School. And my teacher taught us about global warming. And that was in the early 1980s, late, late 1980s, mid 1980s. Okay, so in the 80s, they were teaching this. So if this is a specific group of people, 80s, 90s, now we're into 2023, we're talking over 40 years. So let's imagine the people who had the idea of making up stories um, and trying to um, brainwash everybody. Imagine that they are living in the same time period. Let's say they're my age. Well, now they're in their 80s and 90s or they're dead. So um, talking about global warming, any kind of conspiracy theory that's out there, people will nitpick, take little pieces of evidence and then twist it to whatever they're trying to, whatever policy they're trying to do. The science of it is global climate does change. It has been changing. Now in public education, we talk about how humans affect the climate. I think it should go back further talking about the ice ages because even before people had vehicles and were had any kind of modernized agriculture the earth was warming we had ice ages M much of washington state is carved out by evidence that the glaciers scraped out our valleys and our rivers and we have all kinds of geological ed evidence of this so we know that this has been happening for millions of years, billions of years. It's been happening as long as the planet has been. And um, that needs to be addressed. So, of course, climate is changing. Now, could people be contributing to how fast it's changing? Absolutely, yes. Should that be a reason to exterminate us? No right what we teach well what i teach because i'm a normal human being and i love being alive and i love my students i love people and i'm a christian i love god 
okay? But the climate is changing. I live in Washington State, and when I was a kid, um, my first was living in Washington, um, as a young child, our summers were very rainy still. We had lots of days of rain, and it was not often that hot. I rode my bike, I was very active. I would ride my bike to a swimming pool. I'd ride my bike over to a river and go for a swim. We'd get nice and warm. But imagine nowadays, I mean, honestly, we have like record breaking temperatures. So that's undeniable. I can tell you right now that the last couple of summers have been unbearable. I've actually started looking, should I move to Alaska? Should I move back to Alaska? Cause I used to live in Fort Greeley. Um, so, and Fairbanks. So there's a lot of evidence that global warming is happening. And our behaviors, our reliance on convenience and our busy, busy schedules and everything has to be convenient, which often means um, we are wasting, we're very wasteful. Those behaviors are having an impact on our planet. They're having an impact on our mental well-being, our physical wellness, and every other organism that shares this planet with us. So yes, global warming is real. Did we start it? No, we didn't start the fire. It's been always burning since the world's been turning, right? But we have been contributing to it. We're, we've been blowing on it and we've been adding, adding kindling to the fire, okay? So that is definitely true. We are part of, the, of a problem. It does not mean and it does not excuse how people are being treated and I do agree with you that there are some conspiracies conspiracies happening there are some people behind the scenes who are they who's a puppet who's a pawn who's the mastermind who flipping knows okay there are definitely some people high up there who I definitely agree with you I do believe our administration is a problem whether they're pawns or they're just cheerleaders and going along with what, you know, their party believes in, that whatever. Um, but it is something that's real and we do make it worse. I do not believe in 15 minute cities. Absolutely not. I believe in mitigating the issues in a rational way. And it should be, it should be up to individuals and there should be intrinsic buy-in like as a kid learning about the the environment and greenhouse global you know greenhouse effect and everything um, and greenhouse effect is not all bad we don't want to live in Antarctica all over the planet right we need tropical areas we need warm climates but getting warmer and warmer and warmer like on a hot day in a greenhouse it is very difficult and imagine a greenhouse inside of a greenhouse, which I do that as a way to year round grow in Washington. It's like grow in a greenhouse that's inside of another greenhouse. But when you have to live in that, it is unbearable. I lived in California and the area where I lived would get up to 117 degrees. And we would joke that the, the most abundant life form that we had there were birds carrion birds birds that preyed upon or lived off of dead carcasses because there was just death everywhere there were lakes they were all dried up and there were i mean i just remember going for bike rides and i'd be looking for arrowheads and i would find just dead animals everywhere and these vultures were huge they were just giant size because there was so much death so global warming definitely happening but some of it is cyclical some of it is just very natural we should always be looking at what little even if it's little or if it's massive what role have we played in this what can we do to mitigate this issue is there anything that we can do um and uh, I'll, I'll just leave it at that, that point. Also talking about the harmful chemical compa compounds, carbon. <laughs> okay, before there were human beings, there was carbon. It is on the periodic table of elements. It is massive, abundant in this 
planet. So is nitrogen. Nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen are highly abundant. They're abundant in organic and in inorganic beings and things and air and everything. It's everywhere. We are carbon based. The most abundant um, elements in a living thing and in a living organism is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And you will find those things on this planet, whether we are alive or if we're not. And if we're dying, if we die, those things go back into the system. They either are part of the system with us being alive or they're part of the system with us not being alive. So those elements have always been here. There is the law of conservation of mass, which states the energy that states that matter is neither created nor destroyed, which of course I do believe in creation. Um, but it only changes. It only can be broken down. So it can, it can move from one place to another. Also energy can move from one place to another. It can change form, but it's not created. So that carbon, that hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, all of those elements, whether they are in solid form or liquid or gaseous form are still going to be here no matter what and have always been here ever since the beginning of this planet. We'd like to look at the earth as a closed system, mostly closed, okay? You want it to be a closed system. You don't want to be like with other planets with all the gases escaping, all the oxygen escaping out into outer space, right? So you want it to be pretty much a closed system with everything being here since the beginning of time and still being here as time goes forward. So I just, um, the, those chemical compounds that the, I mean, this is both sides of it, right? Because they're trying to say, well, nitrogen, there's too much nitrogen. There's too much carbon. Okay. There's supposed to be a lot of nitrogen in the air. It has always been ever since there have been mammals and reptiles and other animals living on this planet. There has been nitrogen in the air and us not being alive will not make there be less nitrogen in the air. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. Now, if nitrogen is a problem, I've, I have attended numerous professional developments about global, global climate change. And there are some key ways that we can actually be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Whether we are alive or dead, we are still part of the cycle. We are still part of this system. And all the elements that are in us are still going to be here no matter what. So, um, talking about nitrogen. Now, there are some harmful chemical compounds, okay, like formaldehyde, methane, okay. What do these elements, these chemical compounds are made out of? Some, if, if any of those elements are not freely available, then there will be less of those harmful chemical compounds, right? That, that tracks. So if there's less carbon or if there's less nitrogen, then any chemical compound that has either of those is going to be less abundant. So what can you do? One, you can burn less fossil fuels. That is a no brainer. So if you can, you know, anything you can do to lessen your use of those things is great. Does that mean that you need to like suffer? No. Um, for nitrogen, as a gardener, we, you should, we all should know about nitrogen fixation, which is a natural process that plants, some plants do where they take nitrogen out of the air and they fix it into the ground. So they basically take that nitro, the, the gaseous nitrogen out of the air and they put it down into their roots through a symbiotic relationship with bacteria, right? And as long as that soil is not turned up and that the plant roots stay in the ground, then that nitrogen is being used as is actually being pulled out. So growing legumes growing plants like Siberian peach shrubs, and I believe some like locust plants, like honey locust or black locust. There's many different trees that can do a really good job 
of permanently sequestering or actually pulling out nitrogen and fixing it into the soil. Um, growing beans and things like that. You just want to keep it in the soil. Like the whole like no-till gardening method, that's actually pretty cool, pretty interesting. Another thing you can do is to um, sequester carbon. So sequestering carbon is taking carbon out of the air. Any plant will sequester carbon. So we know like we breathe out carbon dioxide. A lot of the things that we do create a lot of carbon in a gaseous form. So if you plant a lot of trees or you don't cut down a lot of trees, or if you're using it in a renewable way where you're, you're replanting more than what you took, because if you took a tree that's mature and gigantic, there's a lot of carbon in that. You planted a seed. Yes, that's a tree, that's a plant, but it's not gonna sequester as much carbon in that moment as the one that you took. As long as you are keeping the carbon from being released back as a gas, it's still sequestering carbon. So if you cut down a tree, you plant a tree, it grows nice and big, it, it's sequestering all that carbon out of the air, right? It's pulling all that, that carbon out of the air and making it into a solid, part of the trunk, part of the leaves, part of the foliage. It's dropping its leaves on the ground, it's breaking down, which also is releasing um, different gases. Um, but it's a balance and as a, if you were to cut down the tree and you were to make a house you were to make it into a table you were to you know make it into any object as long as it's still a solid you are still sequestering carbon it's only if you burn that material that you're releasing it back into a gaseous state so the more you can plant any kind of plant especially perennials um everything though everything counts so gardening planting trees reforestation planting legumes plants or nitrogen fixation plants that do nitrogen fixation those are fabulous things and that's what i teach in my classroom i do not teach children to have hopelessness i teach them to have goal setting to think about what they want in the future, what kind of dreams do they have, how do you make those dreams realities, how do you live your best life, how do you support each other in a way where we're all meaningfully contributing to a society that is accepting of each other and loving and forgiving and, you know, resilient. That's what I teach is resilience and love and, um, Whenever I see articles like what you were citing about public school teachers being basically obsessed with um, like guilt of about what we've done to our planet, it should we feel guilty if we're trashing our planet? Of course we should. If I remember seeing, now I'm not gonna teach kids to be guilty. They're innocent. They're children. They haven't done these things. What are we gonna do? Blame ourselves? Blame our parents? Blame our grandparents? Um, like my grandparents lived very sustainable lives. Um, like our parents, the uh, generation before me, they worked their butts off. Am I going to blame them for working hard and having to commute two hours to go to work because they can't afford to work where they live? They're commuting and causing pollution because somebody rich lives in that neighborhood and they have to go work in service to those people, but then they can't afford to live there. Like, n absolutely not. We just need to do the best that we can possibly do. And whatever little thing you can do to make things better is what you should do. For some people who are wealthy, they could stop driving their jets. They could stop. They don't need to have that many houses. <laughs> I mean, like, um, I know some people were celebrating, oh, Elon Musk has one of those tiny houses. One of them, <laughs> like, you think that that's where he lives all the time? that's not reality we're spending all this money trying to figure out how to go to mars let's put that into i mean of course that's interesting if i was a billionaire who know what i'd do with my billions of dollars i guess you have a lot to waste it could go into all kinds of really meaningful things here to save this planet i want to talk to you about the spheres okay one of the basic things i teach in science are the four spheres of a planet atmosphere biosphere geosphere and hydrosphere okay so a lot of our planets have some kind of atmosphere. Our planet has the best one. 
why are we going to go try to go to Mars when we can sustainably live here and do a better job living in this planet? Okay. Um, for our biosphere, our planet, this planet, Earth, is the only known planet to have a current biosphere. And that means within this planet system, some of the elements that could be in inorganic things are in an organic form. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord that there is an organic there is a biosphere on this planet. What harm can we do this planet? The planet, the, what can we do to really harm this planet is to not have a biosphere. Because we're what matters. The living organisms on this planet is what matters. Yes, you know what? Mountains are beautiful. The skies are beautiful. Water is beautiful. But life, life is sacred life is sacred that means human life is sacred and they say you know beauty is the night of the, of the beholder you're looking at a rabbit you're looking at a cheetah or a jaguar or a dolphin and you're seeing beauty the beauty is in your eyes right we are creations of god those are creations of god and we are enjoying the creation that god allows us to to enjoy do we add to problems? Yes, we do. Are we causing pollution? Yes, we are. Could we do better? Yes, we can. Okay, so do public school teachers teach children to not have hope? Yes, some do. If I ever have, I'm very, very sorry because I love my students. I love them like they're all my little nieces and nephews. One time I actually found out that one of them was my nephew and didn't know it. That's what happens when you have a big family. I'm not kidding. I did. I actually found out that I was at a conference and I said, um, your last name is what? Actually, my mother-in-law's last name was and we found out he was my nephew. Okay. So I treat my students as if they are my flesh and blood because they are. We are over 99% the same. We are one giant family. And the idea that some people don't see that and they're willing to sacrifice the poor and the lower middle class, that you know we're expendable, that our lives don't matter. Maybe there's supposed to be 500,000 people, apparently Bill Gates, that 500,000 people would make the world a better place. And instead of the billions of people who live here, so apparently the over 90% of the people on the planet should just die, um, not exist. So which 90%? Which, uh, probably not talking about the most, most wealthy and affluent, I bet. So no, public school teachers love public school kids. We care about, public means everybody. It means our Christians and our Muslims, our agnostics, our atheists, we love them. We care about them. I was just on an interview panel today trying to help hire a math teacher. And you know, what we're looking for is passion. Do you really care about this young generation? Do you want to see them have a wonderful life and have hope? I'll tell you right now, I have started to see students, some kids losing hope. And one of the parents told me it's because he thinks that this is the end of days and he has no future. So what's the point trying to um, study for a test if he's not going to grow up? Don't tell your kids that anymore. Okay. If you guys think that the world is going to end, stop telling your kids that. They need to believe in a future. Okay. Yes. Be prepared. Have your prepper pantry. Have all your bug out bags. Have your solar panels and all that good stuff. Have your long, you know, long shelf life. Teach your kids how to fish. Teach them how to tie knots and make a tent, put up a tent. Okay, do all those things with your kids, but don't tell them that there's not a tomorrow. That's a problem because kids are losing hope at the spiritual level of thinking that the world is literally coming to an end. That is as damaging 
as a teacher who they may not have any respect for. If a teacher stands up in front of the podium and they're like saying all this stuff, right? They can go, oh, that teacher's full of crap. Excuse my language. Right? But if mom and dad are saying, we're going to be raptured tomorrow, or the world is ending and Christians are going to be persecuted no matter what, then why would they care about school? Why would they care about anything else? The loss of hope in our young people is not one-sided. It's everywhere. We have to continue to love on those kids and teach them that they're that their life matters, their decisions matter, who they are as a person matters most, okay? Um, we know there's pollution. My asthma goes crazy whenever there's fires and a lot of different events going on, you know, firework performances. It's a real bummer because I enjoy going to bonfires. I enjoy sitting around a campfire and, and making s'mores and having a great life. My asthma gets really bad. There's pollution. You go to LA, like there's so much smog there's pollution we are causing problems we need to be committed to making the world a better place to the capacity that we are able the biggest contributors is the lower class because there's more of us but a single person who's wealthy and owns a jet could make a bigger difference than a single person down here where we are you see what i'm saying i might say that in a convoluted way God bless you. Not everybody is against you. We're in this together and we need to just keep trying. We need to keep our eyes open, be logical, and keep our faith at the center. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I'll see you on my next episode.